Lost in the pleasures, try to rise there to capture. Though we didn't give in to their cries. Just pilgrims and strangers and unholy dangers. The things that this world would entice. Bedlams and fools accuse their wisdom. This morning we're entering into part seven of our 10 week series on the book of Ecclesiastes. And many would say, why would we go on a book like this? Like Ecclesiastes, of all the different books that we could be looking at, all 66 in the Bible, why Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes is a dark book. It is a trying book. It is a book that you don't wake up with butterflies and pixie dust and think that, man, this is, this is great. Let me just see how I can get beat up today. But that seems to be what Solomon has in store for us through Ecclesiastes. And Solomon, as we remember, was the king of all of Israel, and he asked for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. And at the end of his life, he's looking back on all that he's done, all that he's accomplished, all that he's been able to do, and he goes through and says, what is it that is important? What is it that was accomplished? What is it that we should be doing? And so we look at this through the eyes of Solomon, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to see what he has for us today. And we've looked at many topics as we've gone through Ecclesiastes. And of course, today we're going to enter into another one. And that topic today is wisdom. Now, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is wisdom, but today specifically, we're going to test the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. And we're going to see what it looks like in the end of things. Now, it looks like our video is providential. Because the wisdom of following the Tampa Bay Rays pu pu proved futile, vanity, because they lost the World Series if you are a baseball fan. And it was, it was very sad for all of us on the East Coast that we were pulling for a team that we could say, hey, this would represent who we are. And so it was very sad, and I felt kind of like the guy on the video as they've lost it. But by God's providence, when one sport ends, we get to look forward to the next sport that's coming, which is baseball 2021. And so we're going to be excited to once again be ready to go with uh, more baseball because I don't think there's anything else outside of that. <laughs> but wisdom would tell us that it's probably not a good idea to follow the Tampa Bay Rays. It just has not worked out. Wisdom would also tell you that the Detroit Tigers are not really where it works out. But that's why I follow the wisdom of God, which allows me to still follow the T uh, Detroit Tigers and be disappointed year after year, but I still have my hope and my faith in God. So as I'm crushed and my spirit is wrecked year after year, there's still hope for us. And so Solomon today is going to be taking wisdom. He's going to be comparing that to the earthly wisdom to his wisdom, to God's wisdom that God has gifted to Solomon. And so just a recap of where we've been. And you may wonder, why do we spend so much time recapping each week? Well, it's very important. One, the more times we hear the story of Ecclesiastes, the more it gets embedded into our hearts, into our minds. And so when we go through life, we'll always have that to remember as we're testing what God would have us do versus what's happening in the world. So it's important for us to not check out during this. And of course, if we have visitors, this gives us an opportunity to catch them up on where we're at. 
So the book of Ecclesiastes is wisdom literature. It was written by King Solomon at the end of his life, looking back on where he has been and what he has discovered with all of his wisdom. In the very second verse, what does he say? You should have it memorized by now. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So at the end of Solomon's life, he looks back and he says, everything is futile, everything is pointless, everything is meaningless. It's like a chasing after the wind, you can never catch it. It's like grasping at vapor, you can never hold on to it. And he says ultimately in the Hebrew that it's hevel. Everything is ultimately hevel, it's pointless, it's meaningless. Well, that's depressing. I mean, that's not, we don't see that on bumper stickers and t-shirts and coffee mugs or, or on TV advertisement. Buy this, it's hevel, but let's buy it anyways, right? You, they don't really advertise that way. And so what Solomon's trying to get us to do is test this. Test, is this true? And he begins testing it by looking at possessions. Possessions, are they meaningful or are they pointless? And what Solomon argues, and we test and find that he's right, is that possessions can never ultimately satisfy us. Possessions can bring happiness and joy. Possessions can be useful. Possessions can help us in a job or help us to accomplish the task. But possessions, when we look at possessions as an idol, as their ultimate satisfaction, maybe we look to a new car or a new house or a, a new job of as far as the possessions that we will receive from that, and we think, if I can just get this, then I will be satisfied. Well, we find out oftentimes that once we have that, we're moving out on to the next thing because ultimately it doesn't satisfy and we need something more. And so if our hope is in possessions, when we lose our possessions, what happens? We lose ourselves. If our hope's in possessions and we can't get the latest gadget, we feel like we're not whole. But when we realize that possessions are a gift from God and meant to point us to God, then we find joy in having the possessions that we have and we can glorify God with that. Remember what was said is that we can count everything as lost, Paul told us. We can count everything as lost and it be fine as long as we gain what? Christ. So we can count everything as loss. And that's how we need to look at it. And then we thought about time. Solomon went to time and he said, look, time is fleeting. You can't grab hold of time. You can't slow down time. And oh, how we wish as we look back on pictures of our kids and as we look back on pictures with our family, how we wish we could slow down time. But then we realize we can't, no matter how hard we try. And then if we get into a, a fight with a loved one or a spouse, like, can we just speed this time up to get through this? I'm ready to be done with this. I'm ready to go on to the next thing. Or changing smelly diapers. Like, I'd be fine if we didn't have to do that part anymore. And we want to speed it up. But we realize that we can't do that as well. Time continues to go. Time is evil in that sense. And if we put our trust in time, we ultimately find that time is against us. Time can't satisfy us. And we can do anything to try to help. We can put on cream. We can put it on our skin to try to keep wrinkles from coming. It'll still happen. We can do facelifts and tummy tucks. And it doesn't matter what we do. It's not going to slow down the process. And at one day, we will, like everyone else, die. I've been debating whether to color my, my beard or not because I'm starting to get white uh, whiskers. And it's very troubling to me. This is, this is dramatic. I don't know why you guys are okay with it. I'm dramat dramatized. No, dramatized. I am traumatized. traumatized. There it is. Thank you. Traumatized by this. <laughs> In less than uh, 72 hours, we're going to have voting that's going to be closing. And you know what? I think Solomon would laugh at us. He'd say, you do realize that you're going to do this again in four more years. You do realize that this is maybe not perhaps the most important election in our lifetime. You know, I did an experiment this week. I did an experiment, and I went back, and I saw where, of course, Trump said this is the most important election of our lifetime. Biden said it was the most important election of our lifetime. And I looked back four years ago. Guess what they said four years ago? This is the most important election of our lifetime, the most important election. I went back further. 
Obama, this is the most important election of our lifetime. I went back further, Mitt Romney, this is the most important election of our lifetime. I went back further and further. Guess what? At 1992, with George H.W. Bush, I finally gave up when he said, this is the most important election of our lifetime. I finally gave up because I kept going back and back, and it was said over and over every single year. Everything is going to be destroyed. Everything is going to be done if we do not get this right. And every year we're saying the same exact thing. And please do not hear me that it's not important. I believe it is important. I believe we should vote our conscience. I believe we should uh, go out and do that. And if you decide not to, that's still fine too. I'm not saying that it's not uh, a mandatory thing. I'm just saying that this is something that we get to be a part of. But the Bible reminds us that God is sovereign. The Bible reminds us that he appoints the kings and presidents, either for our good or for our judgment. God is the one who reigns over it. So no matter what happens on Tuesday or, or the week after the year, we don't know when it's gonna, we're going to know anything, but no matter what happens, we put our faith and trust not in the political climate, but we put our faith and trust in the one that is over the political climate. And so we trust and we rest there. And therefore, we can wake up in the morning, whether your candidate wins and when you celebrate or your candidate loses and you mourn, we can still get up and keep going because we have a mission beyond this election your mission does not stop when you get your candidate elected or he loses your mission continues and this is a lifelong mission until God brings us back to where he has us amen Solomon then pauses and said well let's stop for just a moment because we're talking about time we're talking about possessions we're talking about justice and politics you might think that maybe the answer is religion but he's careful here because he wants to point in what the answer is and what the answer isn't. You know, religion, going in and doing something for the sake of doing it so that you can feel good about yourself, he says that's not what the relationship with Jesus should look like. That's not the relationship with God that it should look like. If you're showing up to church to check off a box, he says that's religion. You're, you're just going through the motions as if that's what you're supposed to do, if that's what's going to bring happiness and fulfillment to your life. See, God gives us talents, he gives us treasures, he gives us the time to be able to do those. And so how we utilize those for his glory and his good are good things. But if we think by just giving or by just serving that we are doing what we are supposed to do and it's just the act of doing those, we're missing out on something wonderful. We're missing out on the relationship that we can have. You see, God is not a God that we are trying to earn his acceptance Matter of fact, we can't earn God's acceptance. So he came down off his throne, clothed himself in humanity, lived the life on this earth, and then died a death for our behalf so that the sins of us would be placed upon him. His righteousness would be placed on us. Jesus went to the cross so that what? We can have a relationship with him. We can be with him. We can cry out to him when we're sad. We can cry out to him when we're hurt. We can cry out to him when it seems like everything's going, that could possibly happen is going downhill because we have that relationship and we're missing out on something absolutely wonderful and amazing if what we end up doing is we turn the relationship that we get to have with God into a religion that we keep doing to check off a box. And Solomon pauses and says, look, let's make sure we don't find ourselves doing that. And then after clearing that up, Solomon jumps right back in to one of the messages that are most feared in churches, money. And he comes to money, and he says, Tony, you must preach now on money. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. And he's like, yes, you must. And so we looked at money, and we looked at how Solomon says we should look at money. And we were challenged that it isn't just the rich that have a love for money, but the poor also have a love for money. And there was an old saying that those who think um, that, uh, let's see, how to, I don't even remember the quote. I'm already messing up on words. I'm not going to try to remember the quote. But we found out that money is the root of all kinds of evil. And Solomon wanted us to test ourselves last week. He wanted us to see, is our faith and hope and love placed in whether we have money or don't have money? Or is our faith, hope, and love in the gift that money has given us and that we're going to use it for the glory of God and for his purpose, advancing his kingdom, knowing that it is a gift? And are we idolizing the gift or are we putting our faith and trust in the gift giver? 
Now we remember at Christmas time, often we'll get the gifts, and especially as the kid, we don't really think much about the gift giver. We just want those gifts. And anybody that has young children understand that. Give me those gifts. And you're sitting here like, well, I kind of worked really hard. I got punched in the face at Walmart trying to get this gift for you. I mean, I did all of these things to get it, but all they're concerned about is that they have the gift. And so we realize that, but we have to be careful and test ourselves. Are we the same? Are we oftentimes thinking of ourselves in that way that God just give me this gift of money or finances and then you forget that everything is God's anyways and everything that we have is a gift. So now today Solomon is inviting us out of our wallets and into our head. He wants us to come face to face with the wisdom of the world and he wants us to test it to the wisdom of God. Solomon is giving wisdom Or Solomon was given wisdom, and he was wiser than perhaps anybody else in history besides Jesus. Wisdom as king was important to lead his people, but he found that even the blessing of wisdom from God proved only to help in certain areas. Even though he was one of the wisest people on earth at that time and could be in history, it would only help in certain areas. You may have heard the story or read uh, 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 16 and through on where Solomon's wisdom was put to the test if you haven't heard the story I'm going to try to make it PG it's it's more than that but we'll just try for the sake of this you can read it later but Solomon as king he's now putting his wisdom to the test and so what happened is there were two women that were living together and they both had a baby within maybe three or four days apart from each other And a tragedy happened where one of the babies did not live through the night. And so what happened during that is that woman then took her baby and then placed it onto the bed of her roommate, took her baby and placed it in her bed. It was, it was crazy what was going on. And so she wakes up and realizes that her child died. And in the light, then she gets to see that, hey, that's not my child. And she sees that her roommate has took her child. Well, the roommate said, no, that's my child. And, of course, we've got all sorts of drama, like Jerry Springer style, happening right here on this. And so they go before the king. And so they're starting to bicker back and forth to the king. It's like, whose child is this? And King Solomon says something dramatic. He says, go get me a sword. And they bring a sword, and he says, okay, go ahead and chop the child in half. Give this side to this one, this side to that one. The one lady says, fine, let's go ahead and do that. And the other one said, no, let her keep the child. Let her keep it. And Solomon said, stop. That's the mother right there. And the wisdom that he had to do something as as tragic as that went ahead and was spread all over Israel and all over the nations where people would come from all over the world to talk to Solomon because they heard of his great wisdom. And so we see here that there is amazing wisdom that can be had to deal with situations. But Solomon, at the end of his life, also saw that he had the inability to do everything that he wanted to do. Has anybody heard this phrase, that's above my pay grade? Has anybody heard that before? Now, sometimes that happens because you're being asked to do something that you don't want to do, and you're like, listen, you got to pay me a heck of a lot more money to do that if you want me to do that. That's above my pay grade. But oftentimes, it's because what's being asked isn't really your job, and you should be higher up to be able to do that. And so what we would say is, like, if we're trying to cast vision over something or whatever, it's like, listen, that's great and everything, but that's above my pay grade. You need someone else higher up if you want them to figure this out. I ain't figuring this out. That's not my wheelhouse. I'm not doing it. Well, Solomon is telling us in this thing that knowing everything from wisdom, that's above his pay grade. The wisest king in all the world says, look, there's still things that I cannot do. There's still things that happen that I am not able to accomplish. So today, instead of us going verse by verse as we normally do, we're going to be looking at selected scriptures over Ecclesiastes as a whole. And the entire book of Ecclesiastes actually addresses wisdom. But this morning, we're going to look a few verses throughout it. So we're going to start with Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 23. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 23, and we're going to have it on the screen this morning as well says this, all this I have tested by wisdom. He's talking about everything that he's seen, everything that he's done, everything that he's asked us to do. He's doing the same thing. He says, all of this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. So even though Solomon was given 
the God gift of wisdom, there are limits to wisdom as far as mankind is concerned. God has a design for everything in creation, and the wisdom literature calls us to live according to this design. And if we do so, that's wisdom. Yet the world's wisdom is according to man's design, not God's. And so that's why we have to test it and look at it. It's ever-changing. According to mankind, we are constantly evolving and becoming more intelligent. This is according to mankind. The catchphrase of the day, and you may have heard of this, is woke. If you are woke, then you have heard something, you have changed your opinion on something, you've now been illuminated to what it is that you should be doing. And if you've done this, then congratulations, you are now woke. So let me give you some ideas of what woke means. So one example, we have the Boy Scouts. And we even have an Eagle Scout with us this morning, Caleb. So, uh, but unfortunately, as Caleb and I were talking, the Boy Scouts aren't really like the Boy Scouts anymore. Matter of fact, they're not the Boy Scouts at all. They've taken boy out of it, and now they're just scouts. Well, that's uh, interesting because we already have a Girl Scout, right? Well, apparently now we have scouts, and now we have Girl Scouts. But Girl Scouts, are the girl, they're the ones that are standing up for women's rights. And I mean, this is a good thing. And women empowerment, this is a good thing. We here at Confessors of Christ Church want to elevate women as high as Scripture has it for us. We need women. I need my wife in my life. Many of you would shout amen to this because I can't function without her. And so Girl Scouts are calling to raise up women. Yet when the Girl Scouts congratulated Ari, uh, Amy Barrett on Twitter for becoming the fifth women to the Supreme Court, they were blasted until they had to take it down. This doesn't make sense because this is an organization that celebrates women are now being told, yes, we're going to celebrate women, just not that one. Like we want women to be able to break through the glass ceilings and be everything that God had designed them and created them to be, just not that one. Let's, let's find another one. And you see the, the illogical aspect of this. And we see what the insanity behind it. We were at the uh, abortion clinic on Tuesday, and there was a lady that was with us here. Her name was Olivia. And so as we were talking uh, to Olivia, she brought up something, because as we were talking to one of the girls, she yelled out, my body, my choice, which is a very common thing that is said. And so we were talking afterwards, and she brought that same concept up. She was like, I wonder why that doesn't work with masks. I wonder why I can't just walk into Publix and say, oh, you have a problem with it? It's my body, my choice. That, that, that should end it. And then I, you know, jokingly said, yeah, but it's not about you. It's about the other per person or the other people that you could be hurting. And she's like, ah. Now, we were going back and forth, but what was odd about that is the same exact argument that we use to plead for the lives of the unborn is the same argument that they will then turn around and use for masks. It's not about your body. Well, it's about the protecting others. That's why we wear masks, is to protect others. Well, that same argument, they don't see as you flip it around. It's the exact same argument that they now use against themselves. And so there are two options available for us today. Do we follow man's wisdom that's ever-changing? Do we follow culture that tell you how to speak today, then claim that what they told you is now offensive? Matter of fact, we were looking at one of the um, Senate hearings about the LGBT community and how we're supposed to call them, and it's sexual preference is the term that is supposed to be used. Now, three years later from that Senate hearing that they've agreed upon that, that is now offensive to use. In just three years, they've changed the definition on what is supposed to be said versus not. And so my, my goal here today is not to enter into those waters right now, but to show us that if we use mankind's wisdom, what is happening is that we're constantly changing, constantly evolving into becoming more woke or more understanding of what it is that we're supposed to be doing on life. But is that what we're supposed to be? Is that the, the reality of our lives, that we're constantly just trying to figure things out and change things? Or is there a standard? Or is there a standard that is unchanging and is from the very beginning of time to the very end of time going to be the same? And I'm telling you right now that Ecclesiastes is showing us that very thing, and that is the wisdom of God. Not the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God. Wisdom would tell us if it is God who created us, spoiler alert, he did, 
And if God is who tells us that he has a design and purpose, spoiler, he did. And if God is the same today, tomorrow, and forever, he told us that also, then we should probably follow God over man. That's probably what we're supposed to be doing. And Ecclesiastes remind us that wisdom from God is powerful. We're going to jump back to Ecclesiastes 7.19. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. But it is God's design and God's wisdom that matters. It is because we didn't follow God's plan that we actually ended up in the fallen and broken world that we're in right now. Solomon reminds us in the next verse, verse 20. It says these words, chapter 7, verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. You see, sin is what leads to brokenness and meaningless. How many people remember the garden story at the very beginning of Genesis? Most of us, as we open the Bible and try to read through the Bible in the year, we can at least get past that part before Leviticus totally ruins everything that we've ever had in our life as we're trying to get through the Bible. But in the garden story, we see something amazing. We see that God made everything and he made it good and beautiful and wonderful. And we have the garden of Eden there and it's a wonderful thing. But then mankind was given a choice. And here's what I reminded people on Tuesday that I remind us today. People will talk about choice. You know, every time we're given a choice, it goes badly for us. And people say, oh, it's my choice, it's my choice. Well, how did that work out for you? It doesn't. And it hurt us in the garden because Adam and Eve had a choice and they chose wrongly. Matter of fact, we still do this today. If we look deep inside ourselves, we see all the choices that we have and how often we choose wrongly. And so we look here, at the very beginning, we're seeing a choice made in the garden, and we're seeing that the garden was a great example for us failing in that. And then we see how that continues to spread to each generation, to each person, over and over, until Romans 23 says in the New Testament, reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, a life lived without God and in opposition of God is vanity it is futile it is meaningless if we live this life apart from god then we have no hope we have no no way to continue on with joy and excitement because apart from god everything that we put our hands to to try to do is at the end vain the purpose of life without god is nothing and you'll spend your life being frustrated by god Even if you make headway, whatever you do and whatever you gain, it's ultimately going to be lost. Everything that you have will be given to somebody else. As I often say, it's the future of yard sales and, and junkyards, everything that we have. Your name will be forgotten in a couple of generations, and nobody will care about who you were or what you did for whatever short time that you had on this earth. And worse, you will stand before an almighty, holy, and just God to give an account for how you spent the time that God did give you. There will be judgment and justice will be served. Ecclesiastes 7.29, as we look down a little further. See this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought many schemes. God made us upright in the garden, God has given us a conscience to to know right and wrong, but we have suppressed that. We have suppressed it and have gone our own way. Just like in the garden, we want to become our own God, Adam and Eve. That was their thing as they wanted to, to be like God, knowing good and evil. We do the same things today. We continue to do that. So what's the answer? What do we look for? Solomon helps us see that in just two couple chapters later. Verse 12, let's go to verse 12, 11. It should be up on the screen as well. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are collected in sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Kind of a weird verse, isn't it? Not so much for me because I have a cow, which is good. Uh, but we, it, what it is, it's talking about like a cattle prod or a stick that gets them going in the right direction. Many of you that were here last night know that we brought Rosie uh, down to, it's our cow, we brought to the petting zoo, and we loaded Rosie up in the little trailer uh, that we hold all the kids' ministry is. Uh, yeah, that was fun. And, and so we got Rosie here, and then we got Rosie back to our house, and then I had to get Rosie out of the vehicle or out of the trailer. That was fun kind of. And so I'm sitting here trying to pull and trying to get Rosie to come on out. And it would have been great if I had something to go, move. 
but I didn't. And so luckily we were able to get her out. And so the idea behind this is that we see this as a cattle prod or a stick to get us going in the right direction. Ecclesiastes is helping us to see all the meaningless and futility of life and help us to test it so that we can do what? We can get moving, but moving in the right direction. And so the answer is that the gospel is the cure to our brokenness and our meaningless. It's the gospel that's the cure. Mark Dever, a pastor in Washington, D.C., tells us these wise words. Ecclesiastes is God's goodness to us because he refuses to allow us to wallow in our own broken futility. In his love, he frustrates us. Have you ever thought, and take, like seriously, take a moment and think, do you think the frustrations that you're going through in life Do you think that's God using that to bring you back to him? Could the frustrations and the trials and the tribulations and the things that's going on in your life right now, is God using that for the purpose of bringing you back to him? To taking your eyes off the situation because you're running against wall after wall after wall to bring you back to him? Remember when we talked about Ecclesiastes 3 and we talked about time, there's a season for everything. There's a season for all things that happen under the sun. And each and every one of those seasons are there for a reason. The seasons of joy and the seasons of pain, both of them are to bring you back to God. And so are you using the time that you are in, the season that you are in right now? Are you thinking through everything that you're going through and is that pointing you back to God? If it's not, then you're missing out on the beauty of the season, even if it is in turmoil and sadness. God uses that. But it's our frustration with life, our frustration with the world, with humanity that's constantly changing, with the election, with our friends, with our family. All frustration that we experience is meant to point us back to Christ. We're frustrated because we can't fix our problem. We can't elect our way out of it. We can't change the meaning of words and have that fix it. We can't change our identity away from what God has created us to be and that fix it. We can't kill our way out of it and we can't do anything with meaning or substance apart from God. And this sounds harsh and it sounds horrible and it sounds like, man, I come to church to be uplifted, but let me tell you, may this uplift you this morning because this is saying, guess what? You're not the answer. The election's not the answer. We have hope beyond that. And we have the answer today because the answer is Christ. So we put our hope there. We put our our mind, our thoughts, our actions, we put it there. You have been given a mission. You have been given a job. You have been given a reason. There is purpose by you breathing this morning. There is purpose because God has put the beat in your heart this morning to go out and do what he has called you to do. And you may say, Tony, but I haven't been doing that. He still, by his grace and mercy, has given you time so that you can do that. God is so good, and he's so good to each of us. And so we take that and we continue to go. See, this points us back to the one that is able to do all even when we can't. In God's wisdom, for his glory, hear this, he sent his son Jesus. Though he was fully God, he did not count equality with God to be held on to, to be grasped, but he emptied himself into the form of man. He stood in our place as the sacrifice for death. He bore our sins upon the cross. He bore the wrath of God that punished our sins. Our sins were then placed upon him. His righteousness placed upon us for all that put their faith and trust in him. He is our Lord and he is our Savior, so we follow his wisdom instead of the world's. The gospel allows us to recover and to pursue God's wise design. In Christ, we get to recover and pursue that design for our lives, and that means living out the wisdom of Ecclesiastes, which, guess what? It looks a lot like having contentment in where we are. It looks a lot like taking the situation that you are in, and whether it is good or bad, praising God. Whether you live right now in plenty or in little, you praise God. Whether everything that is happening seems like it's crumbling down or you're living at the top of your life right now, in both ways, praise God. It's easy to praise God when we're down because we know we have nowhere else to go. It's a lot harder to praise God when things are going well because we forget God at that point. Things are going well and we think it's all about us at that point. And it's harder. 
So whatever season that you find yourself in, are you taking time to praise God? Are you content where you at? The world keeps trying to push you forward. Go, 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 so that you get your mind off God. Ecclesiastes says, hey, look, take a step back. God is here. He is with you. And every season, every point, every situation is there to point you to him. Are you using that situation to point to him? This, uh, this last, uh, let's see, yesterday, 503 years ago, and one day was the Reformation by Martin Luther. And it was the same thing that we still deal with today. Martin Luther was protesting, and that's where the Protestant church is against the Catholic church. They were protesting. What was going on during that time was mankind was putting forth different situations, and there were things called indulgence that were being done, that if you pay so much money, you could get uh, your family member out of purgatory, and all these weird things that we don't find in the Bible. And what was going on is that the church during that time was doing something that they shouldn't be doing. They were using man's wisdom during that time. The church was using man's wisdom to come up with different ideas and things that were going on. And Martin Luther during that time said, hold on a minute. He said it in German, so I don't know how to say that. But he basically said, hold on a minute. And he said, hold on, we need to put our faith and trust in God as he has revealed himself through his word. We have no way of our own wisdom coming up with what God is or is not or who he is or how he operates apart from his word. And so that's what Martin Luther did is he realized that if we as mankind go to our own wisdom, we're going to find ourselves going down a track that God never intended. And what Martin Luther did 503 years ago in one day when he nailed his 95 theses to the, do the do uh, castle door in Wittenberg, he started a revolution that he didn't even know he was starting at the time. But he started a revolution to get back to the word of God, to get back to God's wisdom instead of our own wisdom. And so that's what we we are called to do we're called to get back to God's wisdom and we do that through here and so some of you may want to hear these words just even if you want to close your eyes during this but let's just hear these as we wrap up our sermon today these are really wise words written by Daniel and Jonathan Aiken who uh, wrote a commentary on Ecclesiastes hear these out this morning we can trust these things are true. What they're talking about are these things that you hear in Ecclesiastes through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the written words of Solomon. We can trust that these things are true, not simply because we fear a sovereign God who is in control, but we can trust these things because we also trust in a God who suffered in order to end the suffering and the chaos of this cursed world one day. A God who is treated unjustly to end injustice one day. A God with scars. So repent and believe the gospel. Allow God to empower you to live out his wise design for the world by the power of his Holy Spirit. And we often forget that it was this God, not only who is the ruler of all things, but it's this God who sent his son Jesus to die, who is God in flesh, that this God suffered for us. This God bore the wrath of the Father for sins that you and I were supposed to bear. But we couldn't. We could not get back to God. It was impossible for us because we couldn't do enough good, yet God in his wisdom and mercy gave us a way that we would have never thought of or never been able to do. Matter of fact, we can't do it apart from the Holy Spirit. And so what we do is we rest in this God. He's not a God that's just trying to overpower you and make you do what he wants to do. But he is a God of love. And you need to hear this this morning. He loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die in your place. So put your faith and trust in him. Put your faith in the God of love who loves you so much that he died for you. Let's pray.